Welcome to Angular Insights. Gil and I are honored to be joined by Lenny, the general partner of Amplify Partners. He's going to be talking about building developer first and open source businesses. We are super excited to have him. Thank you so much, Lenny, for joining us. We're delighted yeah, to have you. Honored to be here, guys. Well, anything for you. <laughs> so quick note so for, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, um, the session is going to be a fireside chat. So Gil will give a quick overview and background on Lenny, and then we will have an interactive Q&A discussion. If you would like to be a part of the discussion, uh, the way to do so is please click raise hand um, to ask Lenny a question over audio, or if you'd prefer to type a question in, um, simply type it into the Q&A section. Gil, go ahead, take it away. Cool. And uh, yeah, please ask, like click the raise hand button as soon as you, you think of something, because we'll try to prioritize audience questions as much as we can. Um, so Lenny, first of all, thank you so much for doing this. Um, really, really appreciate it. Um, it it's, as, as you know, it's been a long time goal of mine to have a co-investment with you, but I'll settle for a shared podcast until that happens. You gotta start somewhere. Um, <laughs> exactly. Uh, so uh, as, as Dan said, you're a, a, a partner in Amplify, um, an awesome early stage fund. Um, the firm and yourself have been dedicated towards backing the technical founders. So we actually have Amplify's logo as one of our uh, uh, funds that inspire Angular Ventures. When we talk to LPs about what we do, is say, hey, we want to be like the Amplify of Europe. Um, so thanks for that inspiration. Um, and your career uh, began at RRE in the venture world, and then Redpoint, another great firm, and now as a, as a, as a full GP in Amplify. Um, your investment track record, uh, not to embarrass you, but is, is simply stellar. Um, EBT Labs have raised $190 million, um, Amplify Series A, Prisma, a European company, Amplify Series A, SourceGraph has raised $250 million, Amplify Series A, Datadog, another company with European roots, at least we can say that, uh, $33 billion market cap currently, um, RRE and Amplify are both investors there, Hunter Corp raised over $350 million, uh, now is a $5 billion valuation, uh, Series B from Redpoint. Um, Light step acquired by ServiceNow, and most recently, I think that was publicly announced as a temporal $25 million seed round. Uh, so not only do you do seed investments for real, uh, but you also have a uncanny, strong, uncannily strong track record of backing, you know, truly iconic companies. Um, I don't know nearly as much about uh, internet infrastructure as you do, uh, but I know enough to know the DBT, SourceGraph, Datadog, HashiCorp are all iconic companies in their category. So we'll we'll be asking you about that. Um, but I wanted to actually start with something that was sort of, you know, when you go to your, your, your bio page in Amplify, um, the first thing that comes up there is that you actually came to the U.S. when you were two years old and both your parents are engineers. Um, and it's a very personal way to start your bio. And I wanted to ask you about those two things. The fact that you were not actually born in the U.S., although anyone who meets you would never know that, um, and that the engineering background of your parents, how has that shaped your work with founders today? Yeah, I mean, taking a, a pretty big step back, um, I think, you know, my... Growing up in, in, in my home was, I'd say, pretty unique to anyone who has U.S. parents, but not super unique to anyone who's raised by Soviet parents. And what I mean by that is there's this really kind of bizarre juxtaposition between uh, hope and the idea of progress and self-actualization that any individual can do anything uh, with this kind of rabid skepticism of everything, of institutions, of individuals, of, of even facts, uh, and so I think that's obviously endemic to anyone who was raised in the Soviet Union or in a kind of an oppressive <laughs> totalitarian regime. Um, and so the solution to that for my parents was always this kind of radical empiricism. Like you just have to, there's, you can, there is a truth, there's, you can, you can get to it through reason and questioning and science. And so to them, you know, as engineers themselves, as having a family that was all either mechanical or civil engineers, my mom used to tell me stories about my great great grandpa, who is not only a Bolshevik but a really famous architect. Uh, they always kind of uh, they always really prided themselves and our family, and then ultimately inspired me to be, kind of be builders. And so, engineering was always a path to be an, a builder, and always ultimately have autonomy over you know, your life and your story. Um, and so to them, it was just no question that, you know, the path to success was through STEM, right? Uh, and so in particular, co having come from a family of engineers, um, I think, you know, they, they pushed me in that direction uh, pretty, uh, you know, pr pretty forcefully. Um, and so, you know, I always thought I was going to be like that. Uh, I always thought I wanted to be an engineer. I wanted to build things. Um, I always used to like hack on little projects on the side as a kid. And then when I went to college to UC Berkeley, I naturally enrolled as a computer science undergrad. Uh, and about a semester and a half in, I kind of 
took, took my own temperature and said like, man, A, I'm miserable at this. I'm really bad. I'm not a talented programmer. And B, I kind of hate it. Um, and so that was a little bit of an oh shit moment where you kind of think about, well, I, I had this path that was charted for me, you know, it's, it's my family's like legacy. And then I'm like, uh, what am I going to do? Um, and so that's when uh, I kind of did an about face uh, and started thinking about, well, what, what do I actually, what am I actually passionate about? What do I actually love? And I always thought that, you know, that I was ultimately interested in tech and startups and again, building things. Uh, and so I, I always had an itch to scratch on, on the investing side. And so I started learning more about this venture thing. And I thought that was a really interesting path. And so I ran really fast and really hard and did everything I could to basically get into this industry because I thought it would be such a such an interesting fit uh, with, you know, kind of my skills and passions and everything like that. Um, to get to your question about how it works, how it's, how, you know, how that's inspired uh, or how that's influenced how I work with founders, I'd say one is, you know, having a little bit of a computer science background, I've got a deep appreciation for the actual discipline. And I know, um, and I know, and, and, and have a, a kind of profound uh, appreciation for really talented engineers who can seeming, who are only bounded by their own creativity. Um, and so I think it's that empathy uh, and kind of respect for the discipline that really allows me to be almost a fanboy when I'm meeting with a lot of these founders and that interest and in, in passion is genuine for what they're doing. So could you, I know you touched on it a little bit, could, but could you talk a little bit more about how you transitioned transitioned into venture and what your journey in, in venture looks like? Yeah, so um, I guess it was a, my junior year of college where I was, you know, I was sort of uh, in between like going down the CS route or doing something else and trying to figure out my path. And uh, I did what any, you know, 20 year old kid without any direction uh, has, which is I went and got a job at an investment bank. <laughs> And so I, I did that always with an eye towards uh, actually getting into venture. And so I, I worked actually in through the, through the, uh, the, the big credit crisis at, at a venture fund that was focused on tech. Um, their business was really kind of co-managing IPOs when they were non-existent. So you can, you can imagine how, how fun that was. Um, but yeah, ultimately I just kind of, I threw myself at, um, at, knowing everything I, you know, studying the tech landscape, getting really, really deep in the trends that I thought I understood. And you started even back in, this was 20, 2008, 2009, you started hearing about this thing called the cloud. You started hearing about things like DevOps. I think the, the, the term was coined in 2009. Um, and I, I really just kind of threw myself at um, learning, learning uh, and being a student of the venture profession and meeting as, as many uh, venture funds and partners at venture funds as I could. And so, uh, one of the funds I met early on was uh, this fund called RRE in New York. Um, and, you know, for whatever reason, they decided to take a chance on me and said, hey, we need an analyst or an associate to come run around New York, uh, make sure, you know, we don't miss anything in these markets. Uh, and, you know, better, to, I guess, in the a, in a case of better to be lucky than good, I, I joined them um, and, met, and joined a really amazing team there uh, that gave me a ton of rope to kind of develop my own theses. Uh, with just enough mentorship to make sure I didn't totally hang myself. Uh, and again, I think I joined them at a time when the only thing anyone seemingly in venture cared about was mobile, local, social. Everyone was looking for the next Facebook, the next Instagram, the next WhatsApp. And I was never, I never really understood those companies or those products. And I'm a big believer in relative comparative advantage. And so when I started in venture, I said, what, what, what's my one edge if I have one? And it's, you know, my somewhat deeper understanding of, developer tools of systems of infrastructure. And so I th kind of dove headlong into those, into those markets, into those trends and basically committed myself to saying, Hey, if there's ever a company started in any of these in New York, I'm going to be sure that I'm, I'm out in front of it. And sure enough, uh, the first company that I ever wrote in a check into was a tiny little company with a purple dog mascot called Datadog. Um, and then I won't bore you with everything in between, but venture has, uh, you know, career venture has these, really serendipitous kind of compounding dynamics where, you know, you do a deal, you build a network, you get associated with that company that allows you to build a deeper network that exposes you to more deal flow. And if you have kind of, you know, the, uh, and if you have um, the wherewithal to, to, to invest in, in some more of these companies that kind of just, you know, that, that gets that flywheel going. And then, you know, fast forward 11 years, this is the only thing I've ever done. So I have no real marketable skills. 
other than being an, <laughs> an early stage VC. I'm not even really sure what those skills are, uh, but I made a, uh, a pit stop in business school. Uh, I then went to Redpoint for two years and then uh, teamed up with this guy named Sunil Dhaliwal, who I met on the board of Datadog. Um, and when he started, and he started Amplify. Um, so Sunil was at Battery Ventures. We co-invested in Amplify, he became a mentor to me. And the mission and vision that he laid out for Amplify was something that resonated deeply, which was what if you could build a best in class institutional scale fund that only worked uh, or, or not only, but really kind of focused on this new generation of technical founder as they're solving some of the most foundational problems in systems in infrastructure and developer tools and cybersecurity. Um, and uh, yeah, as someone who loved those markets and, <laughs> and, and really believed that the, that, that the way to build a, a next great venture platform was being focused and being early, um, it was kind of a no brainer to make that jump and join them as a partner, so. Cool. Uh, so we're going to, like, I'm going to try to take the conversation into two halves. Like, I'm going to try to focus initially on some of your investments and see what learnings we can get from those for founders and then, and then sort of expand the conversation into sort of open source in general and some, some themes that are emerging there. Um, if we look at, and I'd, I'd, I'd like this to be aimed at founders as opposed to VCs. I mean, I would love to learn your secrets in the VC, but from a founder's perspective, if we look at the companies you've been involved in, and, and you know, a disproportionate number of them are, are as you said, you know, and I'm, just, I'm not just blowing smoke at you, they're truly iconic companies. Um, are there traits in common that founders should look to those companies and say, hey, you know, these are the things that seem to be associated with delivering that kind of success over time across those companies that stick out to you? Yeah. So. I don't know if this is going to be super instructive, at least the first comment, but we have this meta theme at Amplify about the practitioner turned founder, which is, you know, this is someone who's an SRE at a web scale company that has uh, kind of a, 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 a discrete set of challenges that they face day to day. Uh, and because of their familiarity with those challenges, they're kind of uniquely positioned to go and build a solution that just so happens that, you know, their compatriots across industry also in, in, would benefit from. That was the case with Datadog. That was the case with Lightstep. That was the case with, you know, with even with HashiCorp, where where Mitchell and Armin were, uh, you know, they were they, they were trying to solve their own kind of software packaging problems, and so they created Vagrant, and then that exposed them to a bunch of other problems around uh, provisioning and deployment and package management, and whatever else you have, uh, and all the other tools that they ultimately and that I'm spawning. But ultimately, I guess the the main thing is. Um, there's there's uh, a, a deep seated pain that founders are trying to alleviate that they have kind of a unique spin on or a unique take on, um, and then with that they've got a vision of the future that that they think that they are kind of uniquely destined to go and build. Um, now the, I think where the rubber ultimately meets the road is you know you have an, you have an acute pain you have a compelling vision. Um, Everything in between is execution and a well thought through product strategy and well thought through go to building out a go to market machine, and a lot of these things can get unwound. But I think, you know, you, the foundational piece is this wedge, this acute pain that you that you have a, a, a kind of your own personal take and spin on, and that you can then uh, pair with a really compelling vision, which helps you recruit, which helps you you know, get, get, which gets you access to money. So that's, I think every single one of those companies has that kind of, that, that, that setup where, again, it's practitioner turned founder, lived some problem, built the solution and, you know, off they went. Are there, are there anything, let me ask you the flip side of that question. Are there any themes that you see early stage technical founders emphasizing and worrying about it, losing sleep over that you think they don't need to worry about. It's not important at the early stage of a company. Yeah, good question. Um, I, I, I think this is just a real sign of the times. I see so many founders getting up in arms over fundraising and unlocking more money at higher prices. Um, even founders that say they don't care about it, they end up messaging me about like, this VC reached out, what does it mean? I think, you know, um, that if you, if, it, if you build a great team, if you build a great product, uh, if it's finding resonance in the market, like the money will always be there. Uh, and I think we've got this kind of, you know, some of these, a lot of perverse incentives around 
more money, higher prices, and it gets you down this rat, rat this rat hole, which I think is, you know, capital is a, it's, 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 it's fuel. It's, it's not the end all be all. And I think there's a lot of short-term thinking that's kind of polluted our, you know, polluted our innovation economy uh, around more money, higher prices, um, where ultimately it's, yeah, it, to me, it's irrelevant, but I do see a lot of founders getting caught in that trap. Yeah. And when, when, you know, when I look at, you know, dev tools companies and I, I struggle to make this distinction, but so many of them, right. I, I mean, a few of them get me really excited and we, we just talked about one, right? But a few of them do get me really excited and I can, you know, but a lot of them just seem to be, hey, a bunch of developers solve the problem for themselves internally. Hey, why don't we turn this into an open source project and put up on GitHub and see if we can get a few thousand stars and raise $10 million and try to build a company. There seem to be so many of those. Is that, are there too many of those? Or, or, are we, or am I missing something if I think that that's not enough? I, I, no, I think I think the bigger problem is that when you're building a developer first or an open source company, there's just kind of an organic growth, especially in the early days that you can't, that you can supercharge, but at your own peril. Um, so, you know, I've, I've talked a lot about this uh, with founders about how the, the timelines for building open source companies and developer companies are a little bit different because you've got kind of three three stages of company building and they're all you, you have completely different priorities in every stage so the first phase stage is really a phase is about you know r d investment and building building the project building the core technology building the developer experience and that could take anywhere from one to three years uh the next phase is really about uh you know it's really about community building trust building um, cementing yourself as a standard. Uh, and that phase is again about just really about distribution and trust and solidifying that kind of R and D investment over the first few years. And that, again, that could take anywhere from one to three years. And only once you've reached a point of stability, once you've earned the community's trust, once you've kind of wedged yourself in the stack, once you're starting to see an ecosystem develop around you, that's when you, you can flip to monetization and really on the value capture part of the story. And I see too many companies trying to parallelize this. Um, I mean, take take something like Kafka and Confluent. You know, they, they just went public this year. Uh, I think the first line of code for Kafka itself was written in tw- tw- 2009. So that's 12 years. Um, Kafka itself was open sourced in 2011. And then Confluent was started in 2014. And so that company was started five-ish years after the company, after the project had time to, to kind of to bake to develop, to get broad adoption. Uh, and then you could come out and start thinking about a commercial product strategy. I think, you know, like the, the counter example is something like Docker, right? Docker launches in 2013. Um, it starts building product. It starts uh, kind of sub, subje- subjugating the open source roadmap for a commercial. And it really tries to kind of, you know, walk this line, walk walk on a razor's edge to, to, do, to build the product, build the community and, and, and build a monetization engine. And I think that, you know, it's, it's really tough to do. It's really tough to line the, to, to uh, marshal resources and get those timelines to line up. And so um, I think it's really important to be thoughtful about how you stage these things and how you build them and how you how you raise capital. So I think you know if you're if you want to start a company and a project and a product at t equals zero all at the same time, you know raising less, spending time building, spending time on community, and then really just pouring gas once you've seen that inflection point. Uh, in adoption, I think that's the path forward. Right. So you, you've you've talked about potentially delaying the uh, purchase of market power, right? Or, you know what norm what in normal industries we would consider sort of marketing or advertising spend. Um, and you've talked about the first two phases. You've talked about product and community, and I, I want to ask about the tension between those two because sometimes, you know, you'll see a company with amazing product and they don't have any distribution advantage. And sometimes you'll see another company that may have a, a okay product, average or above average, but they have some kind of a, a distribution advantage because the founders came out of some company or there's some other popular open source product or some other thing. How do you weight those two things? And what's your advice to founders who truly believe they have some product advantage but have no distribution advantage whatsoever? And, and from a seed investor point of view, are you looking for people that have distribution advantage or is it enough to have killer product that we'll figure distribution out later? Yeah, this is going to be one of those gray, I, one of those gray, gray areas where it really depends, um, right? I mean, if you have a truly, 
you know, disruptive technology, um, this kind of zero, which, which involves the kind of the zero to one behavior change or, you know, 10 to hundred X boost in performance. And it's also, by the way, really easy to adopt and educate your developers on. Um, that's, that's, I think that's, you, you can, you can 100% get by, um, uh, you know, with that said, this is why, you know, I stress this idea of, of, of a wedge as, as really kind of foundational in building developer tools. Like if you have a good enough wedge and you do have broad adoption and, you know, you're used by hundreds of thousands of developers, you can use that to really kind of jerry-rig uh, a compelling platform story or a compelling enterprise uh, product story. Um, and we've seen this time and time again, um, you know, as much as we like to believe that technology is, you know, uh, technology adoption choices are meritocratic, that, that's not at all the case. Um, and so I think uh, what, what, what that emphasizes though is I, I would say it's not necessarily the best kind of technology that wins, but it is necessarily the best product experience. And what that means is everything from great documentation to great uh, kind of thoughtful developer relations, outreach to great content. And that entire, you know, in, as in marketing speak, that whole product, which is, you know, you got this core, but then everything that augments that makes it usable, approachable integrations, like that matters more than anything in developers because in developer land, because you're saying, hey, you've got this, you've got these heterogeneous stacks, you've got all these tools, why and how am I, is my tool going to play nice? And so play nice with all this and, and support, you know, a bunch of disparate workflows. So um, yeah, I'm not sure if that answered your question, I'm a little rambling, but. No, it does. I, I, I actually, um, we, we actually want to turn over to a few audience questions and then I'll, I'll come back. But before we do that, let me ask you just to continue that thought. Um, founders who are focused on metrics around distribution, you know, any tips for them? Like people talking about GitHub stars or contributors or forks or, you know, uh, long running instances or, you know, all of those different issues. Like, are there any metrics that you think are really, really valuable for founders to focus on and any metrics that you think are kind of more vanity metrics that don't, don't really matter? You know, again, like I, I think it, it really depends on the type of product you are. Like, if you're a JavaScript library versus a pub sub queue, like your your metrics are going to be totally different. Um, I think at the end of the day, the only thing that matters is uh, the 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 number of users or applications that are using you in production. Um, everything beyond that is kind of a leading indicator to get to that point, right? Because if you are being used in production or in my developer workflow or my DevOps workflow that helps me get you into production, that's that's ultimately the golden goose. Uh, and so um, whether it's again, live instances, whether it's um, you know running servers, uh, clusters, whatever that proxy is, uh, it's ultimately about engaged production users. Um, and so everything else is kind of, you know, it's, it's signal uh, that, or it's a, it's a leading indicator that helps you get to that point. So that, that to me is, you know, that's, that's, that's gold. Awesome. Thank you so much. We are now going to be joined by John Carlo. He is the CEO of Y Data and he's based in Lisbon. Hi everyone. Hi Han. Hi Gil. Thank you for setting this up again. Uh, hi Alain. Great, great meeting you. Great to meet you. Uh, I'm co-founder and CEO at Y Data. We are a developer tool for, for data scientists. And well, uh, my questions are, are a bit similar with Gills, but would like to have your thoughts on, on the fundraising side. So we have explained that to build this open source product, there are these three stages, building the product, building the community, only then think about commercialization. Uh, I guess that also because for the adoption, getting early adopters and then a mass market. But on the fundraising side, uh, when we reach the stage of building community, for instance, uh, our needs for fundraising will be already on Series A or may maybe sometimes Series B. So what are your thoughts on going raise without revenue and having these metrics that, as Gil said, could be vanity metrics or indicators of adoption, as you mentioned as well? Yeah, so, so the ultimate lagging indicator of, of uh, for an open source business is, is revenue. And I think the payoff for a lot of these companies is incredibly backloaded. But be, these are ultimately incredibly efficient businesses because you have effectively built your pipeline and pre-qualified them, uh, right? So, you know, thinking about companies like HashiCorp or Confluent, you know, across every conceivable kind of SaaS or, uh, or software go-to-market metric, they're just insane businesses, hyper-efficient, uh, very fast sales velocity. And 
obviously really, really fast growth, um, right? Uh, and so the, but, but, but to get there, um, you know, you've got to be comfortable putting up with a bunch of zeros, right? It really does like the, the revenue curve really does look exponential where it's, you know, zero, 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 one, 10, 40, a hundred. That's, that's a pretty typical ramp. Um, and so, you know, when I, when, when we were looking at the Hashi series B, um, I think they had maybe just around a million of ARR, um, maybe even a little bit less. Uh, but when you did reference checks and you talked to any enterprise co company, you knew that their products were powering absolutely mission critical workflows. And it wasn't just one product, it was a couple. Uh, and so you didn't have to squint too hard to imagine like once they actually turn on the, the, the monetization story and go from community building into value capture that this business is going to scale uh, really, really fast. Um, so uh, long story short is I think, you know, if you, if you're talking to investors that are familiar with these business models, um, there isn't going to be a, Hey, you need to be a million of ARR by series B. You're not, you're there. You need to be, you know, this many users necessarily. I think what you're, what you're looking for is a, you know, credible story of how this is going to get really, really big with, and superimpose that superimpose a compelling kind of enterprise monetization strategy on top of that. So, you know, product dependent, but if you've got, you know, thousands of users and there's a story of how, you know, 10% of those users are going to be paying you hundred thousand dollars a year. And sure enough, an VC can talk to those users and validate that there's an enterprise product that you would spend money on. That's, that's generally good enough. And I think past series B, once you've actually flipped into from community to monetization, build, uh, building out the community to building out, you know, kind of your monetization engine, then I think the conversation really does shift to, you know, ARR and LTV CAC and all those metrics that, you know, <laughs> that, that SaaS investors love. Awesome, brilliant. So we're now going to be joined by Mohammed. Uh, Mohammed, if you'd like to please introduce yourself and then uh, feel free to ask Lenny your question. Definitely. Thank you so much for the for getting me here. Uh, I'm uh, Mohammed. I'm based in London. I'm CEO founder of Visca. We are creating uh, an immigration uh, platform for the for the new ecosystem. My question is that how you can see the future of work will be changed and the idea that you don't have to be based somewhere to do something. You can you can be based anywhere and do whatever you wish for, for your job or uh, as a freelancer. How this idea will actually change the, the, the work that we get used to, to do during the last 20 years and how we can capitalize on this, uh, the new startups. Yeah, so I, I think people like to kind of look at the, this remote first trend and say, hey, COVID is really what sparked it. Um, in reality, um, I mean, I guess open source companies have been doing this for decades, uh, right? They've got distributed teams. Uh, and I think the nature of open source, the nature of you know, platforms like GitHub really enable this collaboration across, uh, across you know, geographies, time zones, et cetera. So this is something that you know, for us that have been investing in these companies, this is motherhood and apple pie, right? We've, we've seen this trend for the better part of a decade. Um, I think the rest of the world is frankly just catching up to it now. Uh, and, you know, I saw this survey, I think a few days ago, where now the number one criteria for someone taking a job is flexibility of where and how they work. And I think compensation is maybe only two or three. Um, I think in some ways, this is going to make life for startups a little bit harder uh, because if Facebook, Google, Amazon start giving their employees more flexibility over where and how they work, that's that dulls one of the edges of how startups can actually recruit employees. Um, funny enough, I don't know if this is coincident or not, but Gil, I'll be curious if you guys are seeing this, but we've seen startup salaries rise you know, meteorically over the last six months in particular, where a lot of our seed stage companies are paying, you know, 50, 60% more than they typically were for early engineers. Um, so I think in some ways, depending on how long term, uh, how, how long term these shifts are, I think it's going to probably uh, make comp, uh, it's probably going to make competition for talent um, across the world a little bit harder for startups because before, again, I think most, most big companies really prioritized, you know, uh, centralized hubs. Um, as far as how you know how it will change work, um, I think I think it remains to be seen. I'm personally kind of skeptical of this hybrid model where you've got some employees remote, some employees uh, in the office. I think you kind of have to go all in and, and have a defined policy because I think it's going to be tough to maintain culture and information sharing, which is absolutely critical to building, especially complex products. Um, 
but I think, you know, it does give up opportunity for companies to really, um, for, for startups to, to, to really innovate here and give us a bunch of new tools, uh, that facilitate information sharing, how, to, you know, uh, how, how, how do we maintain social bonds in these new distributed workforces? Uh, so it's going to be an, uh, certainly an interesting uh, team to invest in. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right, cool. Uh, thanks. Uh, next question is from Joe Johnston, uh, who's in Belfast, uh, Northern Ireland. He's the head of growth at BuddyBase, which is an open source first uh, enterprise application platform. Hey, Lenny. Um, thanks for that, Gil. Um, just touching on, you mentioned around downloads, right? And it's a very common metric for open source companies to track. But it's taking that step a little bit further. And how do you track and measure you see to within an open source project? It's trying to understand the flows and where to a, convert people to maybe a higher tier in a novel core product or not. That's where I'm finding difficulty. And have you seen any creative ways of doing that? Yeah, so I guess I'd say you're not alone, uh, and this is one of the one of the main things that every single one of our companies wrestles with, where their open source community and usage, and particularly engagement, is a total black box. Um, the best thing you can do, I mean, some companies offer instrumenting uh, their open source uh, their open source code with some um, with some telemetry data, so you that you emit some telemetry data, and provided that you are upfront about that. Uh, and frame it appropriately. Like I haven't seen users rebel, even though people do ultimately can can opt out of that. Um, I think the, the best the best thing to do that is to you know is to have um, you know is is to continually try to guide people to uh, re reveal a little bit more about themselves. Uh, and the best way to do that is just having a big engaged community. So one of our companies called Prisma has done really a masterful job of creating resources and creating online uh, kind of whether it's forums or chats where people sign up or people kind of log in, they provide their email, they provide a bunch of identifying information about them. And then you have this large engaged pool of users that you can always go to for product feedback, for questions. Um, and so that's, you know, that, that, that's, that's, uh, there's no silver bullet, I would say. Yeah. Um, and so it's really about just creating more touch points where people can kind of raise their hands and self-identify. Yeah, sorry for hogging your time here, but I have another question, um, which I didn't let Gil um, know about, so apologies. But yeah, so we, we're really engaged with our community. So paradoxically, we, we know very little what's happening in the product. So like Prisma, we've created basically a cloud product, which is a sandbox for people to try so we can track stuff. Um, and it's taken a lot of resource but just touching on the cloud, it's always this, we always have this conversation with a lot of some VCs and, and just some other people who you know, are knowledgeable around developer tools and they're always like, well, why don't you just go to the cloud? But in, in reality, that, that resource and, and just that mindset is completely different and it would take a lot of work. Have you seen many organizations, for example, maybe even Prisma, have they considered going straight to the cloud, not just self-hosted, um, having a self-hosted architecture and offering, but have you seen that done successfully? And um, where, where companies manage both sides of the field, really? Yeah. This the, the dominant model in open source where, you know, you got, you build, you build product and community in the open source, but the actual kind of commercial product is all cloud, right? And I think the company that's done this the best is someone like Databricks, uh, which created, you know, with the, the, its, its founders created Spark. They did an amazing job of evangelizing Spark. Spark kind of grew, you know, it, it became stable and trusted and uh, this dominant analytics engine all in the open source. And then Databricks cloud platform is what actually unlocks value from it. Um, you know, our company Temporal is, is following a very similar path. Um, you know, Prisma even is, is, is following a very similar path with some of what they've got coming, um, which is gonna be really um, a, a cloud product that unlocks a bunch of workflows in and around the kind of the Prisma ORM. So I, I do think this is the dominant model. It does, um, it does, uh, it, it is cer certainly a far departure from the traditional open source business model of, of selling kind of discrete applications or uh, forks of the, of the upstream uh, or even providing services and support. But uh, using your, you know, your unique advantage uh, and knowledge that you have around the project and your intimate knowledge of your user, you can, you can create pretty compelling cloud products or very compelling cloud products, I should say. And so that's what we see as, as really the dominant model emerging in, in monetizing open source. Thank you. 
So does 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 that mean, Lenny, that you're you're no longer seeing companies that are kind of open source, like hardcore open source, where like the fact that it's open source is the thing that causes customers to adopt, or seeing companies that are sort of open source also, where it's like, right? It's almost like there's three models, right? I mean, maybe you can help us sort of create a taxonomy of open source strategies, right? There's yep. Like I'll I'll try it and then you tell me if I've gotten this right and you sure. add your your insight to it. One is like the whole reason that we're here is because it's open source, right? That's why they're using it. Um, a second one, and then maybe we're charging for support or something like that. A yep. second one is like open source plus some kind of a control layer, which is the thing you're actually paying for, which is the enterprise version of the product. That's yep. the real business. So it's almost like we've got a right. That's the thing we're actually selling, and then there's an open source which is bringing people to that thing. And then there's a third version, which I, I'm seeing a lot of, which is kind of like open source also, which is like, we have a thing that we're selling you and oh, don't worry, there's also open source available in case you decide you don't want our paid version yeah. as a, almost as a, as a safety belt, right? As a seat belt yeah. or some kind of a safety envelope for making it easier to adopt that thing. Is that, is that, Right. Yeah, right yeah. I, I think there's there's kind of the original, you know, the, the original pure play open source service and support Red Hat model, which is we're going to build a massive community and we're going to sell a licensed, we're going to give you a licensed, fully indemnified, fully tested, battle tested version. And that's kind of like a, 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 a you know, we're selling you cover your ass license for your you know, CIO or CTO to make sure that if something goes wrong with this piece of software, you can call on us and we'll, we'll help remediate. Then there's the, the the really the model that emerged in the in the 2010s, which is open core, which is hey, there's a big community around some open source project. Um, we're going to hold back some features from the open source around collaboration, around security, around manageability, and we're going to either ship you a, a uh, an enterprise version of that, uh, or we're going to have some some you know uh, some application that we ship on top of that open source that unlocks some features for you. Uh, and then more recently, to your point, is you know. It's all, it's, we're all, we're open source, but you know, for you to go and install this, to manage it, to provision users, that's, that's a pain in the ass. So what we're going to do is we're going to sell you, we're going to give you the open source and we're going to do ops as a service for you. And we're going to host it. We're going to add some bells and whistles. We're going to manage accounts, all that sort of stuff. And so that's really the model that we see emerging. And so uh, in that, in that world, you know, these businesses do end up looking a, a whole lot more like SaaS. Uh, and the role of open source really is in those in those kind of first two company building phases around we're going to build it in the open so people can see it we, uh, and battle test it. And then we're going to build community and build kind of trust. And so that way, you know, that way um, a company like Temporal is able to say, hey, we've you, this thing is running at Uber. This thing's running at HashiCorp. Um, you know, this is a battle tested piece of technology. Come run and we're going to run it for you. Come run Temporal. But we're, we're come run temporal on our cloud. And so, you know, that way companies just have a lot more confidence, you know, uh, running mission critical, business critical applications, having seen it be successful in the open source community. So the open source really becomes a way to kind of build, again, build that build that trust with the community. Cool, so let's, uh, we're, we're gonna stay in uh, Northern Ireland for the moment. I can't get enough of the accent. And we'll bring on Michael Shanks, who's actually uh, the CEO of BuddyBase. Hey, Lenny. Uh, thank you for taking the questions. Um, yeah, so actually, what, my question was very related to what you, what you just talked about there. And um, so we are um, that open core model um, whereby we're adding these premium features into, into the open source product. And for us, they're actually, some of them are quite integrated. And um, what that means for us is that when we've come to uh, get, you know, give a paid version out, um, it means that the whole product is actually will actually be licensed under a proprietary license essentially or you know a source available license and have you ever have you seen this being a red flag either to enterprise or investors given that one of the key things about open source is that there's you know the avoiding lock-in thing because you're, you're you know it's a proprietary license now that you're selling it so yeah it, it, it's it's tough to say um how much of that is a loud minority of open source purists online that are causing a, a ruckus around, you know, like some of the licensing jujitsu that we've seen over the last few years and how much customers actually care. Um, you know, in my experience, 
customers talk a lot about lock-in and wanting to avoid it. And when push comes to shove, they will adopt a piece of software that solves their pain uh, most, most seamlessly. Um, I think licensing is, or uh, not licensing, but uh, lock-in is such a distant concern um, or lock-in is such a distant concern for a lot of these customers where it's just not, not like, kind of like the very top of the hierarchy of needs in terms of buying decisions and adoption decisions for software. Um, you know, in general, I, I, I may have a little bit of a contrarian opinion on some of this, uh, on some of the licensing stuff that goes on, where I just think at the end of the day, open source is really about building as big of a tent as possible uh, and building a community. And even if, you know, one of the cloud vendors picks up your product and starts using it, I think overall that's it's probably even a net benefit because it just does continue to build that community. Um, and so, uh, and there, there's always an opportunity to go and sell again, like, licensed, supported, indemnified versions um, that include all the features. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I don't know if I'm necessarily answering your question, but um, I, 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 think, I think at the end of the day, what really matters is, I think, yeah, at the end of the day, what really matters is you build a product that people love, as trite as that may sound. Um, and I think the licensing is, um, people like to talk a lot about it because it's a controversial topic, but I haven't seen it really being a, uh, a factor in, you know, uh, a factor in, in a positive or negative light in terms of, you know, uh, supporting or stifling growth for companies. Cheers. Very cool. So we'll now be joined by Philip. He is the founder of CubeStack and he is based in Berlin. Philip, the floor is yours. Hey, thanks for having me. So CubeStack is, and I have to introduce this a little bit because it's relate, um, relevant to my question. Uh, so CubeStack is a Terraform framework in the same way that Spring Boot is a Java framework, right? And where Spring Boot tries to offer the best developer experience for building microservices in Java, CubeStack tries to offer the best developer experience to build Kubernetes-based platforms using Terraform. And so with your background, my question for you is basically, um, what are your opinions on building on top of Terraform as an ecosystem like this? Um, and what should I be most worried about? Well, Terraform's really become a standard. Um, I remember I was talking to uh, Dave McJannon, CEO of HashiCorp, a few years ago, and he had this amazing analogy where you know Terraform is really like what HTML is. What, what Terraform is to, to kind of cl the clouds as what HTML is to the web and kind of the browser, uh, right? Where it's really this definition language that allows you to provision infrastructure and compose a cloud from these different building blocks. Um, so overall, I mean, Terraform's everywhere. Like I said, it's a standard, and so building on a standard is pretty good. Uh, with that said, I think there's a few, a few projects that are worth uh, that are on the horizon that seem to have a ton of steam uh, that do uh, at least make you question Terraform's long-term standing as the de facto standard and how we provision uh, uh, we provision cloud resources. And now one of the things that I'm hearing a lot about recently is Pulumi. Um, so that's uh, that. That's definitely something to to keep in mind. I know AWS, obviously, with you know things like CDK, Cloud Developer Kit, and Cloud Formation is always uh, is always you know is always in the background. Um, so I, I think cloud provisioning and provisioning tools are always one of those things that are seem to be constantly refreshing every five to ten years. Uh, and so I would just be mindful about what's coming, what enterprises are, are starting to play with, because what they're starting to kind of play around with on the side could could very well become the new standard, you know, in the next half decade. So that, that's a pretty good segue to, to ask you a question I wanted to ask you um, about HashiCorp. Um, and, you know, I, 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 I tell everyone I'm a technical VC, I really do my best, but I'm nowhere near your level of, of deep tech understanding. But I think HashiCorp is an interesting case um, because it's already achieved, as you said, that sort of standard status. Um, I think it'd be very interesting for us to understand from your perspective. And I think you joined the company as an investor in the Series B, but you, you know the history of that company well. Can you talk about what the seed thesis would have been for that company, what the A thesis was, what the B thesis was, and how that kind of how that story emerged? And the, yeah. the other question I'd, I'd love to ask you is, you know, now that you are doing a lot of seed checks, would you have done the HashiCorp seed? Like, what would that have looked like? And, and would you have done it if you put yourself in your in your own shoes back then? Yeah. 
So I, I guess let's work backwards because the series B thesis was pretty obvious, which was, hey, um, we've got this massive community of DevOps folks who love our stuff. Uh, we're everywhere. We're in within every Fortune 500. And we've got this compelling product strategy or, or enterprise go-to-market strategy where we're going to come in and we're going to basically sell you know, discrete applications that unlock certain features around collaboration, security, and governance for Terraform, for console, for Nomad, and really for Vault, um, which was kind of their new hot product that had just started to inflect. Um, and so, so, there, so in yeah. other words, the, the question was, we already have a standard. Can we monetize around that? Exactly. Yep. Yep. Effectively. Okay. Um, you know, going back in time, I think uh, the seed, at the time of the seed, it was really Mitchell and Armin and Vagrant, which was basically kind of a virtual, a local virtualization toolkit that allowed you to, to kind of think Docker before Docker, package up your application and deploy it on a VM uh, some, uh, in, in the cloud. Um, and that was uh, like a very popular tool, um, but not a clear monetization plan, not a clear how it becomes a big company, but clearly that the, the, the prominence of Vagrant told you that, you know, Mitchell and Armin were, were, were special, uh, right? They were incredibly talented engineers. They knew how to build community. They had, uh, they had uh, kind of, you know, they had uh, certain design uh, sensibilities with the way that they, you know, they built, built things. And so the bet was really on these two quite literally kids at the time um, and their ability to go and build open source, develop communities, and hopefully they could turn those communities uh, into you know kind of growth engines for a company. Um, that would have been that would have been the seed bet, um, you know. And then the A was, I believe, at the time of the A, they had a more substantive product portfolio. I think they had a tool called Packer, which was how do you kind of bake containers and and then deploy them. I think by then they had Terraform as well. So you started to see more of this kind of product uh, or project vision coalesce around. There are these discrete workflows that every organization has to, you know, uh, provision infrastructure, deploy applications on that infrastructure, secure uh, applica uh, secure that infrastructure, uh, and we're going to go and kind of build that. We're going to build the Legos to unlock those DevOps workflows for every organization, and then you know you're kind of betting that they can go and execute on that vision because they're they're starting to see some inflection around these communities, but it was still a, a pretty big leap. Um, so, you know, I think the seed bet was really, hey, these are two really smart guys uh, that have built a successful project and can they go and replicate that and, you know, can they go and replicate that across di different projects or products views? The, 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 the second bet, the, the Series A bet was really, hey, um, there's, a, there's a more complete vision here around we're going to change how DevOps are done in the enterprise across a suite of products and we're starting to see them replicate this. Uh, across a few projects now. And then the Series B was really, hey, they've done that and now can they go and monetize that? Um, I guess the obvious answer is that, no, I wouldn't have done that. <laughs> I wouldn't have done the seed bet uh, because I, I, I didn't. <laughs> um, and I, mean, I think- you, that, you actually, would, let, me, let me drill on that. You actually saw them at the seed stage? I, 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 did, I, I knew them at the, I, I saw them right past the seed. I knew them at the A. And at that time, it was very much a Docker is, Docker is eating the world bet. And they were- Kind of taking a, a, a platform agnostic approach and really saying, hey, there's going to be a bunch of things. We don't know what it's going to be. Is it going to be Docker? Is it going to be Kubernetes? Is it going to be something else? We're going to be, you know, we're going to be kind of uh, Switzerland here. We're going to kind of be a play on the inherent heterogeneity of the cloud. And uh, at the time, you know, I got kind of swept up in the Docker, Core OS, Kubernetes madness. And so I frankly didn't even pay that much attention to them, which was shame on me. Uh, but um, yeah, I mean, uh, so I, I think, you know, I think the funny thing is uh, it's over your career, and I'm sure you know this, Gil, you're, you're, you're kind of, you know, you, you learn a ton, your tastes change, and how you think about different opportunities at different stages changes. So, um, you know, now I pattern match whenever, like we just, we literally just signed a term sheet for, uh, for a deal where the founder is a 21-year-old, he's built a successful open source project. That's very toolsy. It's very vagranty. It's in the kind of the cloud native networking space. And the reason I did it is because this guy reminds me of a young Mitchell or Armin. And so the goal is to hopefully learn from some of those, uh, learn from some of these uh, companies and pattern match um, yeah. as much as you can. So but it, it, it does sound like HashiCorp is a pretty classic evolution where the, the Series B bet is basically a scaling bet on a pretty much a set of established facts, right? Just can yes. they scale it effectively? The series A bet is kind of a complete vision with maybe imperfect or incomplete execution, 
right? But the but the story is there. In other words, yeah. the, what HashiCorp is today is available to someone who looks at the Series A deck and has a meeting with them at that stage. And the seed stage, you know, company really doesn't contain within it the the rest of the story, right? It's just great mm-hmm. people who are sort of intuitively solving a problem. Is that a fair mm-hmm. summary? And does you know, on. does 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 that observation contained within it sort of one of the ultimate difficulties of doing these kinds of, of investments, which is there is a degree of randomness in the seed stage of totally. that may not be there in some vertical, like we, you know, we at Angular do a lot of vertical software. We do a lot of horizontal infrastructure software. The vertical software, it's all there in the seed stage. They know the industry, they know the product, they know everything. It's just, ah, we're not even sure there's a market, but are we on, yep. right? Build it. But it, in some of these, you know, tech, tech-driven dev tools, that's a lot less clear often. It, it is, yeah. And I think it's because these often these developer tools products are have a very broad surface area. Um, there's multiple product cycles that you have to go through. Uh, and, you know, we talked about kind of these discrete stages of company building. And so you have to continually reinvent yourself. The variables change, right? I mean, the rate of change in the infra world uh, is you know, it's breakneck speed. And so platform shifts, new languages emerge, new application types emerge. And so you're constantly kind of reevaluating uh, and, and, and reweighting different variables. Um, and so I think the thing you really need to screen for is a founder that can look, see around corners is, you know, the quote unquote visionary. And I think if you solve for that, then the markets, then, then you, you feel much more comfortable taking the market risk because you know that A, they're either gonna shape the market or B, they can respond to to different uh, to different twists and turns in the ecosystem. Right, and you know, we were talking about this earlier, and, and you know, I know it's an important you know point for you. Can we, can we talk a little bit about trust, and and specifically, what is what is your advice? You know, some best practices perhaps for how you know early stage teams can create developer trust, because that really is the currency. I mean, it's become a cliche now, but developers don't really want to be sold to. Um, they have to trust you. They have to love you. How can teams, you know, create that or accelerate that? Are there are there skills for that, or is it always organic? Is it is it just anyone who's trying to do that is already failing? No, I mean, I look. I think some companies just do have a natural way of. Uh, I mean, again, Prisma is one where honestly, our the, the, one of our central theses for investing in the A was this was a Series A or a seed stage company, but their DevRel machine and the way they talk to developers and the community they built. Uh, was, you know, some public dev tools companies can't replicate that. And I think a lot of that emanates from the founders. Like they, they, it's like the for us, by us, right? They've built it for them. They, they're, they're, they're kind of key leaders in the community. They're in the forums answering questions. Like I, I heard, you know, Jay, again, Confluent went public recently. I think Jay, Jay, their CEO is still answering a ton of the questions in the, in the kind of the, the, the Kafka forums. And so I think that um, you that that ne- it needs to it, cu- it obviously emanates from the founders, but then there's tactical things you can do, right? Where dev experience, the dev experience isn't something that you bolt on, uh, but it is the product itself. So that means treating docs as a first class citizen, right? Content, education, um, you know, making sure that your engineers are in the forums, interface, being kind of developer obsessed. Um, and so I think those are all things that are cultural and stem from founders and then understanding your priorities, right? Because you, as a seed or series A or even series B stage company, you can't have a uber sophisticated DevRel machine, but you could figure out what you're gonna be great in. And is it gonna be, you know, are you gonna be as good at, uh, can you just focus on content and your blog and be as, you know, half as good as DigitalOcean? Can your docs be as impressive as Stripes were in the early days? Can, you know, you have, a couple advocates that are larger than life figures and really create a movement like Netlify did. Um, and so I think you just got to figure out where you're, where there's the most bang for your buck, invest in that. But again, I think you've got to build that kind of developer obsessed culture. And that starts obviously from the founders. Right. Um, we, we, you, you talked about this earlier when, when Joe is asking you about, about licenses and, and, and your, your advice, I think it's, you know, very good advice was sort of product first pricing later, right? Um, having said that, do you have any favorite playbooks or any any examples of sort of counterintuitive 
pricing strategies. I mean, it's not exactly a dev tool. It's not a dev tool at all. Um, but you know, I, I think a lot about Airtable charging people for colors, right? It's not a obvious thing to charge for, but it's so indicative of when you're getting value yeah. from the product that you know I, I think it's a great example. But do you have any examples of sort of some of your favorite pricing tricks? I, I wouldn't say I n- nothing super concrete, but I guess the the way I've always thought about it, the most powerful um, motion that uh, I think. It, that 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 kind of that that lends itself to an open source core or a kind of an open source piece of infrastructure is, you know, you initially come in and you establish yourself as a standard or you as kind of a wedge as a tool. You do something very specific. Um, you you kind of build trust, but you implant yourself in the stack, um, right? And you're known for one thing. And then from that position, you can then expand out to become this platform architecture within a company. And I think even for that platform architecture, you're not really talking about charging anything. Um, but you want to be, again, if you're an infrastructure component, I think people just have a little bit of a revulsion of, of paying for things that are that low in the stack and they want something that's free and open source and trusted. And I think that's perfectly fine. Um, and then once you are in that privileged position, I think you then sell kind of solutions or discrete applications. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think Splunk's kind of the canonical example, even though they're not open source, but they, again, they come in through like an IT ops use case. They end up building out this logging, log collection and analysis infrastructure. So you're dumping everything in there. And then they come in and say, hey, we're gonna sell you a SIM. We're gonna sell you IoT analytics. We're gonna sell you X, Y, Z. And before you know it, right, you're not only blowing out your costs by dumping you know, tens of terabytes a day, but you're also paying an arm and a leg for all these applications all these different groups. And I think that playbook is replicable for a lot of open source companies. Uh, it takes time. It takes, again, punting on monetization. But I think once you're in there, once you've got a company and an organization or a team kind of captive, so to speak, once you're mission critical, you know, there's so many ways you can unlock value, particularly if you're in di- like, a, like, you know, if you're like Prisma, for instance, you know, you're sitting in front of a database. So there's the possibilities to monetize are endless, but it just, you know, it involves a little bit of patience. Um. So last question from, from me, and I think, I think we can probably wrap after this, but we, we're talking about dev first companies um, and something that we're noticing in our deal flow and even in some of our portfolio companies is that, you know, they're still selling to what we would call the developer persona, but that persona has changed since, you know, in the past 10 years of the dev tools market, right? Um, in, in my observation, the developers have become less of the, you know, yeah, they're in the basement and they're wearing hoodies and, you know, don't try to sell to them and they all want to see, they all work in the CLI, right? Um, and they're actually okay with paying and they have budgets and they're not in the basement and they're actually business people who also code and they're actually okay with GUI sometimes. And a lot of things that are not, that have changed. What are your observations on how the developer persona has changed and will continue to change going forward? Yeah, I mean, Je- Jeff Lawson, the CEO of Twilio, wrote a, wrote a great book, uh, which talks a lot about, about kind of the, the, the rise of the developer as a first-class citizen in companies. And I think the biggest shift we've seen is that, you know, kind of IT and, and software dev has gone from a cost center to a real revenue center. And this is, I mean, this is no surprise, right? This is, you know, we've been talking about software in the world since 2009. And so if, if you're not treating your developers as first-class citizens, your, your host, if you're not investing in developer productivity, if you're not in, in, investing in, you know, kind of best in class uh, software delivery lifecycle tooling, like you're just going to get behind. Um, so I think that that trend is, you know, pair, like, uh, that's, 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 you know, on the banner. Um, I think you've got to invest in your developers. And, and by the way, they're still the most scarce resource that most organizations have. Um, and so how can you make them as productive and effective uh, as, as you can, I think you've got to invest in tooling and platforms and, and, and software to, to really unlock, uh, you know, growth there. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's, that's the big thing. Um, you know, the other thing that we're seeing is in general uh, is we're, we're seeing kind of this decomposition of software into a bunch of primitives where, you know, historically you've had, you know, you buy Salesforce and then you have an army of consultants that have to come in and basically make Salesforce work for your particular workflows for your organization, the way you do business, blah, blah, blah. Now what we're seeing is we're seeing, you know, uh, basically a bunch of building blocks, um, right? Whether it's, you know, you're dumping and you're analyzing all your data in Snowflake, and then you've got a bunch of primitives that live on top, 
but ultimately you're exposing a, a set of building blocks for your developers to go and build really, really powerful internal tools and have your, those tools work for your business, not the other way around. And I think that's going to continue. That's going to continue to happen. You know, we've seen a bunch of low code type stuff um, or a bunch of kind of workspaces like notions, you mentioned Airtable. that, that to me is a huge trend. Um, and I think part of what's enabling that is more and more people becoming software literate, whether it's SQL, whether it's Python, whether it's like some of these WYSIWYG things, I think this is kind of an inexorable trend. And so the line between, you know, the, the line between your developer sitting in the basement and your business analysts is going to continue to blur. And I think that's overall you know, super exciting for, for guys like you and me and everyone on this call. Yeah. Awesome. So we have one last question uh, that we're going to take. It's from Kostov, and he's the co-founder of Paradigm and based in London. And he was wondering, Lenny, what do you think about um, what non-developer hires uh, should a seed stage company make if they're building a developer first open source business? Uh, I mean, I, probably not a surprise, but I think someone who can think very critically about building that developer relations machine. Um, and it's generally someone technical, it's someone very extroverted, it's someone who's, it's almost, it's a little bit of a unicorn role, but what you're really looking for is like part product, part evangelist, part like solutions, architect, developer success, but it's someone that can go and talk to your users, create the feedback loops up, uh, for product and engineering, uh, create content, but someone who is basically taking what you're building and being the, that representative and that liaison, that, that conduit between your engineering team and the community. And you, know, you could call it product, you could call it DevRel, you could call it developer success, but it's some outward, but it's someone technical who's outward facing. I think it's, it's, it's an incredibly, uh, it's an incredibly important role. It's incredibly hard to find people that are good, uh, but it just completely accelerates your timeline. If you find someone who's really good at it. It, it's a hard role to fill though. I mean, we, we oh, yeah. companies really struggle with this. And, and most of the companies that, that we work with at really the early stage end up defaulting to just doing it themselves. Yeah. Because they're like, that oh, yeah. sounds, By the that way, sounds they, like they're, a unicorn. It's not, it's not a substitute for founders. For founders themselves have to do this. Uh, but if you could find someone who you can task with ju this just being their kind of full-time mandate, it's, it's huge leverage for, for you as founders and obviously for your team. Uh, Lenny, uh, thank you so much for, for this. I really, really appreciate it. Um, you're, you're a font of wisdom, and I, I, I think maybe we need to do a whole other session, a whole other session next year just on some more of the deep, the, some of the details of open source. Um, but I, I really, really appreciate it, um, and uh, we'll continue to look for something that we can we can do together. Um, and uh, really, really again, thank you so much. Uh, join us next week uh, for a, a session with Ash Fontana. Uh, he's going to be talking about AI first, so from Dev First to AI First. Uh, and um, thank you so much. Thanks, guys. This was fun. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Have a good day. Bye.